um, uh, good morning. Uh, so I'd like to give a talk to, to talk to you today to describe the kind of work we're doing on a hybrid cloud framework uh, at PES University. Uh, so before I start, let me thank uh, EMC, which has partially funded some of this work. Uh, so, these are the, so this is you know, the reason why you might have hybrid clouds. I'm sure uh, this is very familiar to most of you, and that is you, know, you can use that for cloud bursting, for migrating workload from one cloud to another if that's necessary. And of course, this supports scalability and uh, high availability. Uh, so this is the high-level architecture we're looking at. Uh, we've actually, the, the work we've done, which I'm going to talk about today, uh, is federating uh, OpenStack with Amazon. Uh, so we've also done work to federate OpenStack and OpenStack, uh, but today I'll talk about what we've done to federate with uh, Amazon. Uh, so this is the way we have implemented it. Uh, we have leveraged the cells architecture. And in the cells architecture, uh, each there are a number of cells. Uh, I think OpenStack doesn't define what a cell is. It's a collection of hardware. It could be uh, you know, a data center. A cell could be a rack. You can set up the cells whichever way you want. And they can also be hierarchical. Uh, so at the top level, there's a top cell which has the cell scheduler, and that decides in which cell the request will actually be executed. And then below that, there, is, there are child cells. Uh, so in a normal OpenStack cloud, uh, what happens is, let's suppose you have an OpenStack cloud with four data centers, and you create each of the data centers, you make each one of them a cell. Uh, so then you'll have a top cell and four child cells underneath. Uh, so what we have done, we have created a new kind of cell. We have extended this architecture to have a new kind of cell uh, called a pseudo cell. And this maps, so any foreign cloud like Amazon and so on, uh, gets mapped into a pseudo cell. Uh, and since the, side, uh, the child, uh, the cell architecture is general and it's hierarchical, within Amazon also you can have a hierarchical mapping uh, if you wish. And uh, I think the advantages of this kind of an architecture uh, will become clearer when I continue. Uh, so this is you know, the way that this has been deployed. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, you see three cells, the top cell, the private cloud cell, which represents the open stack. And then there's a pseudo cell, uh, which represents Amazon. So the bottom three cells make up the hybrid cloud. And then this is connected through a VPN node across the internet to Amazon, which has a VPN on the other side. Uh, so again, the implementation details. Uh, so our, uh, we are looking at OpenStack as the primary cloud, Amazon as the foreign cloud, and leveraging the cells architecture. And the way we've implemented the pseudo cell in a high, in a uh, kind of uh, high, higher level. Uh, so the pseudo cell is a data structure which contains statistics like you know the utilization of the cell and so on and so forth. And it also has drivers which can perform operations on uh, on the uh, machines in the pseudo cell. Uh, and there's also communication between the pseudo cell and uh, the top level cell, in that the pseudo cell periodically updates its statistics to the top level cell. Uh, so, what we've done is we've rewritten these uh, pseudo cell drivers so that, for example, the pseudo cell driver uh, gathers statistics about uh, Amazon and it gathers statistics and it also can spawn VMs on Amazon and things like that. Uh, so one of the questions is, how do we handle security right now? Uh, so currently, we are not, this in, is not integrated with the federated security work that is going on. Uh, we are using the EC2 APIs for authentication. And so we store the EC2 credentials, and we're using that in our driver. Uh, but in future, we definitely do plan to integrate with the federated security APIs. Uh, so this talks about uh, you know the the, the uh, flow of the work. Uh, so you have the pseudo child cell at the bottom. Uh, at the top cell, you have uh, the, the, the interactions. Uh, as I already mentioned, the pseudo child cell uh, updates the database and then makes calls to the interface driver to uh, change statistics and so on and so forth. 
sorry. Uh, so this represents the way a typical workflow occurs. Uh, so let me uh, mention, uh, so for example, suppose there's a request to create a VM. Uh, so what happens that the request to create a VM, uh, it arrives at the top cell. And the top cell looks among all of its child cells uh, to decide, it looks at statistics about the child cell and the capabilities of the child cell. Uh, for example, if you want a GPU or something, uh, it looks at all those capabilities and then it selects the target cell to create the VM in. Uh, so in our case, what would happen is that the top cell would look at the cells underneath it, which is the OpenStack cloud, that's those are regular cells, and the pseudo child cell, which is Amazon. And then it would make a decision about which one uh, to, which cell to create the VM in. And uh, if it decides to create the VM in the chi regular child cell, which represents the local open stack, then the flow is as it normally is. It goes to the child cell, and then the child cell is select the physical server, and then it will call the Nova compute agent and so on and so forth and create the VMs. On the other hand, if it selects a pseudo child cell, which is, uh, represents Amazon, uh, then it will be, the request will be sent to the pseudo child cell, which will then use the Amazon drivers to create a VM uh, in Amazon. And once it creates the VM in Amazon, part of the pseudo child cell uh, API is to return the endpoints, the parent cell, so you can talk to the VM, and uh, so on and so forth. So I, I think this uh, is a diagram which shows how simple the flow is, and I think it also illustrates many of the advantages for approach. Uh, for example, if you take a look at it, uh, we didn't have to invent a scheduler which will decide whether to create a VM on Amazon or a VM in, in OpenStack. Uh, we used the already, because we are mapping Amazon into a child cell over here, we are already uh, got a scheduler, the cell scheduler which does the job. Uh, so another question is that suppose in a later date you might want to make a policy-based decision about uh, which is based on statistics, like for example, how many VMs you have in Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, if we had taken a different approach, uh, then we might have to invent new infrastructure to map all of this. But what happens is, as I said in one of the earlier slides, uh, there is already an interface between the child cell and the parent cell, whereby the child cell periodically keeps on updating its statistics to the parent cell. And so we simply just follow that protocol. Uh, and uh, uh, so basically the advantage, one of the major advantages of, of our architecture uh, is that uh, we are leveraging the, the code that already exists in OpenStack. We are not having to invent a whole new bunch of code uh, for scheduling between uh, OpenStack and uh, you know, Amazon or for you know, periodically uh, updating statistics. For example, uh, if you want to monitor uh, information about the child cell, uh, monitor information about the, another example I can give is, as you know, NOVA keeps track in its database of every VM that's created. Now, because this Amazon is mapped into a child cell, a pseudo child cell, the, whenever the child cell creates a VM, it automatically passes the information about the VM to, the, to NOVA. So NOVA automatically updates its own database with, with the new VM. So again, we didn't have to write new code for that, and the advantage is I think the major advantage for approach uh, is that it leverages the code that's already there in OpenStack to simply uh, extend uh, uh, the federation concept. Yeah, so the... Uh, proposed architecture is simple, and the good thing is if you look at many of the clouds which already exist over there, uh, they all are all uh, hierarchical. OpenStack has felt the need for this now, uh, but there's no cloud out there which treats the entire cloud as uh, you know a, just a gigantic collection of machines. In practice, there's still some organization into data centers, racks, hierarchical organization, and we are simply leveraging that. So you could extend this to other things uh, as well, like eucalyptus, for example. Uh, so future work, we want to take this forward as a contribution to OpenStack. Uh, we need to integrate federated security. I think those are the major, major pieces of work that we are taking forward. Uh, so now I'll play a small video, uh, which is a demo of how this actually works in practice.
Hello, so we'll be showing you a demo for, of the hybrid cloud using OpenStack and Amazon. Here we see an OpenStack cloud, dashboard of an OpenStack cloud running on one of our servers. And this is the console for Amazon EC2 which shows you the resources of all, uh, all from our account being used. So we have set up uh, the hybrid cloud such that as the load on the local cloud keeps increasing, the instances are going to be routed onto Amazon and a tenant on OpenStack can use instances even though they are on Amazon as his own instances, giving a perfect hybrid cloud situation. So to show the, launch the demo, we'll launch instance and give the name as instance1 and we give the image source as Seros. And we launch this instance. This instance will take some time to build and schedule and load onto the system. And here we see that the instance is now running. So check on Amazon and it's not look, it's not spawned here as yet because the load on the local cloud has still not increased that threshold. Now we launch a second instance by the name of instance 2 and we again give our image source as the ROS and launch the instance. This instance will again take some time and it will get launched onto the local hypervisor of the local OpenStack cloud. So here we have successfully spawned our second instance and we once again check Amazon and it's still not spawned on Amazon saying that our threshold given on the local cloud is still not reached. Now we launch a third instance and we select the image. and launch the instance. And we wait for it to get launched. Depending on the threshold, again it might either be spawned on the local hypervisor or it might be spawned on Amazon. So a third instance has been launched on, on the local cloud and Amazon still continues to have zero instances. We launch a fourth instance. and wait for the fourth instance to be launched. Uh, so if you notice, this one is being spawned on Amazon, but the instance goes through all the state changes like spawning and so on that is normal for OpenStack. Again, a fourth instance has been launched and we check Amazon 
and here it shows us that there is one running instance. Hence, from the instance 4, from the local cloud, since the threshold has crossed beyond our memory, uh, our RAM usage has crossed beyond our threshold given, the instance was dynamically launched on, on Amazon. And here we see that this instance, on the instance which says running, has been launched here. And we have, we have created a virtual private cloud on Amazon and created a subnet called hybrid cloud and given the range of IPs as the same as our local cloud, that is in the 10.0.0 range. So hence the IPs, are, IPs also are same as the IP of the local instance 4 here, that is 10.0.0.5, has been brought about into Amazon and the Amazon private IP is 10.0.0.5. We have routed the virtual private clouds onto the VPN and hence there is network connectivity between our local cloud running on a server here and the remote Amazon cloud. So this uh, any tenant using these instances can use instance 4 as for, for the tenant he can use instance 4 as it's been running on OpenStack even though it has been spawned on Amazon. So um, that's the demo of us. Thank you very much. Um, so that's a team of students who have worked on it. They're undergraduate students. I uh, appreciate if you give them a hand. And, uh, thank you. <clears throat> so if there are any questions. Uh, have you done anything to integrate block storage, Cinder, with EBS? Uh, so uh, EBS is accessible only from within EC2. Uh, Cinder would be our next target. Right now what we have done is we have integrated the VMs in, and so uh, the e uh, equivalent uh, uh, Cinder should be possible uh, since it's uh, IP storage. Thank you. Can you tell us more about the network infrastructure? Did you assume that that was already there? Is it that spun up on the fly? Um, what are you assuming there? Uh, yeah, so for the network infrastructure, right now it's very simple, and that is, again, work that needs to be uh, done. Uh, so right now we assume that there's a subnet which, which connects the VMs, uh, a flat subnet uh, net network which connects that, and we build that through the VPN on, on the fly. Uh, so it's not as configurable as uh, it, it, it might be needed. A follow-up to that, what was the latency that you saw from the VM that was on AWS and the VM that is on the private cloud of OpenStack? Uh, yeah, so we haven't uh, measured that actually, but uh, I, I would assume it's uh, fairly high. Uh, so uh, definitely we'll measure that and uh, try and in the in our next iteration, we'll, we'll publish that information. Hi, very nice. I assume there's a Thank mapping you. between the local flavors and the Amazon instance types? Yes, so, so that's uh, again a good question. Thanks for asking that. And uh, that again is more of the work that we have to do. So right now what happens when, when you ask for a particular flavor of OpenStack, uh, then we map it in the code to the closest flavor of Amazon. And so it's kind of hard coded in there. But obviously there should be some sort of a module which will allow you to configure it. Because for example, uh, right now we take the smallest uh, instance type we can find in Amazon, which still satisfies everything that you have. But you may be willing to uh, want a smaller instance on Amazon because may, the larger instance costs more. Uh, so different users want to trade off differently. Uh, so that's part of the code which needs to be taken out and then made a separate module and uh, made configurable. Great, and as a follow-up to that, um, I assume you have to do the same with images, but that's not just a mapping. Do you have to pre-stage the, the same image in EC2 that you have local and then also map it? How does that work? Uh, yes, so we've done some work on automatically converting the images, uh, but I think in a practical situation, since it takes a long time to transmit the images uh, from one cloud to another, I think in practice you'll have to have an image on Amazon which is ready. I think that's the state of the art now. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks. Hi there. Um, at the OpenStack consumer level, are you exposing the OpenStack APIs or are you assuming an EC2 compatibility API? 
Uh, sorry, at which, which level? So this is all done through Horizon, and it's, it uses all the OpenStack REST APIs. So for example, okay. uh, if you wanted to write a script, you would just write a script uh, using the same Nova APIs that, that you're familiar with. All right, thanks. Sure. You, you spoke about contributions um, back to the community, so which part do you need to contribute back? I mean, was this the pseudo cell part, or? Uh, yes, the pseudo cell part, yes. I think that will be a contribution to Nova. Okay. Yeah. Hi, this is a nice work. Um, okay. I was just curious if you had any issues with, you know, address management. You kind of have a range of addresses in in the VPC that you created, and then you've got OpenStack's own IPAM. So, do you, did you run into any issues there, or were you able to get around that easily? Uh, I'm, get... I'm not completely the, familiar with the networking part of it, the details. Uh, so what I believe is we have a network range in uh, EC2 and the IP address range inside, and we are somehow managing that. But if you please uh, send me an email, I will get, find out and get back to you on that. Hey, what's happening? Uh, Trevor Powell from RMS. Uh, I had a question with the feedback loop that you have or may not have. I'm just curious to know um, if the instance, something happens to the instance on the Amazon side or another cloud, um, how does it reflect back in Horizon or and vice versa? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So right now we don't have an alerting mechanism, uh, but what happens is that periodically the cells have to report statistics back to the top level cell, uh, and then they would know that, uh, you know, uh, that something has happened to the VM at that point. And uh, so, but I, I think Amazon does give an alert if something happens to the VM, so we have to relay the alert back. Uh, I'm not sure if you have done that yet. I have to check that. Hi. In the context of uh, federation, how are you managing a VPN channel between your source cloud and your target cloud? Uh, managing in what sense? Uh, I mean, uh, how, how, do you, how do you set up a direct link between your uh, OpenStack cloud and your Amazon instance? Uh, so on Amazon, on Amazon entire deployment that you create. Yeah, on Amazon there is a VPN infrastructure, and we have set up a VPN server inside our OpenStack cloud, and those two work together to set up the VPN. Uh, Okay, but do you have the ability to provision uh, a VPN through your console? Uh, no, so as I said, right now the networking part is to some extent hard-coded, and so we need to make that more flexible. That is future work. Okay, yes. thanks. In, in terms of uh, being deterministic with the VMs that you spin up, um, you show utilizing private cloud initially and then essentially bursting out to a public cloud. Yes. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how you reclaim resources. So if I need to spin down VMs um, and I actually like shut down some ones in my private cloud, thinking about the mechanisms to go back out and reclaim them from the public cloud back into the private cloud for money saving? Yes, uh, so that's a very interesting question. And uh, that relates to the mechanism in OpenStack for doing that. Uh, so right now, this is uh, done through heat. And uh, so it should, be, it should work seamlessly in the sense that uh, uh, if, you, if heat spins up and spins down VMs, uh, then that will work with the cell scheduler and then some VMs will get spin, spun down. Uh, so if you want to specifically spin down the Amazon Amazon VMs uh, preferentially, uh, then we have to modify the policy. Uh, so right now the policy may say spin up the VMs, and then it'll just spin up the VMs because it assumes it's an open stack cloud. And then it says spin down the VM again, it assumes it's an open stack cloud. Uh, so the policy will have to be now made cell specific, saying that when you spin up the VMs, uh, spin it up uh, beyond a certain level to go to Amazon, and then you spin it down preferentially uh, terminate the Amazon VMs first. So the policy has to be modified to make it cell specific. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, yeah. One is um, how how much how how much have you scaled this, and also would this work in a public to public like uh, an OpenStack public cloud like HP or Rackspace to Amazon? Uh, so I'd answer the second question first. Uh, it should work on a public to public because we've done it on this on an OpenStack to OpenStack cloud, and uh, assuming that Rackspace and HP are both uh, close enough to OpenStack, it should work. Uh, and uh, sorry, what was the first question? If you could just repeat. 
Sorry? Oh, scare, scare. Uh, yes, we have done this uh, on uh, our own local cluster of about two or three machines and with Amazon. Uh, we obviously need to uh, scale it more and see how it works. And that's where, you know, if anybody's interested in trying out the co code, we'll put it on Stackforge. And people can, uh, if they have a larger clause, they want to experiment and give us feedback, that'd be welcome. Okay, thanks very much.